what's up hello leading wizards today we're gonna be looking at leading flops from the big blind it's a bit more common than pvp iso leading that we looked at in the previous video let's just get straight into it Today's lesson in a nutshell, I'm going to be looking at stack depths of 20, 30, 40, and 50 big blinds. I wanted to include shallower spots as well, but once you get to 15 big blinds and below, there just isn't that much RFI from most positions, as the range tends to just split into limps or jams, uh, at least for later positions. I'll use the preflop ranges that do not include limps to keep the data as clean as possible and without interference from certain combos missing, etc. I think this is just a cleaner and better way to run experiments like this. If you include the limping ranges, there's going to be a lot of specific combos that wants to limp, so they're going to be missing from the range. It's not the best way to try to find patterns if we're going to have to keep that in mind all throughout. I was planning to do different position pairs, but I realized that it's going to be too much content. So if there's an interest in that in the future, I can extend the series to include different position pairs as well. For today, I'll focus on big blind versus button, since this is the most frequently played spot. I'll do some aggregate report work and look at overarching themes and big picture ideas, but I'll also do a few deep dives into strats on certain boards. So first of all, we can have a quick look at the global leading frequencies from the big blind. Uh, you see on this table that I've categorized it in different position pairs. We can see that we are doing more leading at a shallower stack depths. So at 20, we're going to be leading more than at 25, which are going to be leading more than 30 and so on. And this makes a lot of sense. The positional disadvantage gets negated to some degree when we're shallow. So the shallower you are, the less worried you are about building pots out of position and vice versa. The higher the SPR, uh, the more careful you have to be about building pots out of position. This is a common theme in poker and not just in this situation. We can also see that we're leading more versus the button and versus the cutoff than versus low jack and under the gun eight. This also makes a lot of sense as the button range is just going to be a lot wider and we're on average going to have more equity versus a late position range than an early position range. Uh, we'll start with the 20 big blinds here and have a quick look at the ranges first. We can see here that we're actually not VPPing that much from the button at 20. We're VPPing like 41.6% in total and 5% of that is coming from all-ins. Yeah, quite tight range from button, I would say. Button, a uh, big blind calling range is going to look like this. Uh, we're not gonna have any of the pairs and we're gonna be lacking very heavily on the offsuit ace portion. Outside of that, we're pretty well covered and we're not particularly heavy in any specific combos we are going to have a bit of a, an advantage on the low connected boards. As we can see, we have a bunch of these hands, both off suit and of course we have all of them suited. While if we look back at the button range, he's going to be lacking very heavy here, even in the suited portion. And of course in the off suit portion, he's going to be yeah, lacking most of it. So uh, already very easy to see what type of boards we will be interested in leading on. We can open up the aggregation report for this spot and have a quick look. And have a quick look. Um, okay, let's click into here. Okay, so here we have the aggregation report. As we can see, there is actually not much leading going on overall. If we look at the global frequency, it's just 3.7% in total. If you do a bit of sorting, however, we will see that there are a few hands that really like leading here. So what you can do is just use this function right here where you can select for different factors. Uh, first, we can look at high cards here and we can see that six high, seven high, lots of leading. 
like 30-40% leads on both of these and it's 8x and 5x or 5 high bit of leading as well. Outside of that, there's really not much leading going on. We can see that rainbow boards are slightly preferred over flush draw, but quite similar. Um, monotone, no leading. Pairs, we prefer the non-paired boards. Uh, for the pairs, it's going to be very specific boards like, uh, yeah, just the low pairs, like uh, 6 6x, 5 5x, and so on. Connectedness, we do prefer when it's connected than when it's not. As we can see, like, leading percentage very low here. But if we go over to the filters on the right, we can do some sorting here and see that there are actually a bunch of words that really like leading. So if we filter based on what we just saw in this reports tab, that 7 high and 6 high is very good for us. Uh, now you can already see we're leading like 34.5%. Uh, uh, we know that connected is good for us. Um, we know that flush draw and rainbow is good for us. So not monotone. And we know that these are good for us. So now we can see that already, if we're just sorting like this, seven and six high boards, uh, not uh, not tripled and connected, not mono, uh, we're already leading over 50%. So what I'd like to do next is to have a quick look at our top leading board in this formation, which is gonna be 764 rainbow. All right, so this is the sim. Um, of course, the aggregate reports are all ran with um, just one size, B33 and all in, but that's not necessarily the optimal size for this board, of course. So I think a good place to start is to rerun it with the AI solver to see what size we actually do prefer. I'm gonna use dynamic sim. I'm gonna open up one of my own sims. Um, just take off only bet sizes here and I'm gonna select a sim that I've created myself. Uh, we can have a quick look if people are interested in sizings. I basically just included a bunch of different sizings to make sure we cover all options for, for this spot. You can use automatic and it's gonna be perfectly fine as well. Uh, but sometimes it's gonna lack a few options that I would like to have in there. So I prefer just building my own sims with dynamic. So let's run it like this. All right, so here we go. So we can see that we're gonna play 5.4% of 3.3x jam. Uh, and over half the time, we're gonna bet for two thirds. Uh, I think a good place to start looking at sims like this is to go into the ranges first um, and have a quick look at the equities and how it's distributed between the two ranges. So. We're basically 50-50 in equity here with our range having a slight lead. Uh, we also have more equity realization than IP, which is for the most part just driven by our net advantage. Uh, if you click the tab to see hands here, uh, we can see that we outperform with uh, straights, two pairs, not with sets, but yeah. Uh, for the most nutted hands, we do have quite a big advantage here. So that is what makes us want to play these leads. Yeah, we can see it here in the advanced bucket as well that for the two top portions here, we're just outperforming quite hard. So yeah, back to the strategy, we can see that our preferred sizing is indeed not one third as in aggregate report. I think the all in hands are usually pretty cool to study in these spots as they're not always super intuitive and they often come with mega master effects. Uh, so getting called by worse hands while folding out better hands. I think if we look at the hands that are wanting to jam here, like for example, King eight and Ace eight, uh, I think these are very good examples of this. So let's have a look at what happens when we jam these hands. Remember we're jamming for 3.3 X pot here and King eight suited just wants to do this pure, no matter if you have a backdoor flush draw or not. King eight off as well and wants to do it a bunch. So we can see what happens. The idea is that we're getting called by better hand, by worse hands while folding out better hands. So we can see here that most of these offsuit ace X and king X. So for king eight suited, for example, we're folding out king nine off, king 10 off, king jack off, king queen off, 
We're even folding out the suited portion of the better hands here, right? Which is amazing results. We're even folding out some paired hands, you know, we're folding out like queen four suited, king four suited, uh, ace four off. Uh, meanwhile, we also get called by quite a few hands that we actually dominate here. So for king eight, it's hands like king five suited, for example, nine eight suited, ten eight suited, ten eight off a little bit. Um, and for ace eight, it's also the eight nine and ten eight plus all the combos of uh, ace-5, uh, king-8. These effects are pretty cool. Of course, they're kind of... You have to rely on opponent playing perfectly for these to be super valuable in-game, but I think these are always like very cool spots to study, in theory at least, just to see what happens. Yeah, you have a bunch more of these. Of course, you have like the queen-5, jack-5, ten-5 suited as well that share a lot of the same attributes with these Mega Master effects, but I think you get the point now, so I won't spend any more time on that. Uh, outside of the Mega Master jams, we also, of course, have to add some actually paired hands to avoid villain just being able to snap off, like, every ace-king off, king-queen off, etc. A note here is that from the paired hands that we're jamming, you can have a look here, just sort it by this, it's a bit easier. Uh, we can see that for 7x, for example, we don't really jam many of the ace-high hands here that are paired, you know, like ace-7, ace-6, ace-4s. These are not getting jammed because we do want villain to have one of these suited ace-x hands to call us when we jam for value with the pairs, right? So that rather we're using the medium-high ones like 10-7, um, jack-7, queen-7, uh, king-6, queen-6. Yeah, the ones where we don't have the ASX that can call us. For the two-thirds size, we're using a broad mix of hands, including some intuitive ones and some very unintuitive ones, I would say. Uh, I think for most people, it's very easy to find the 7X, the 6X, the, let's see, like 10-8, Jack-8, King-5 off, etc. I, th I think these ones are kind of easy to find. But I think it's less easy to find like the king nine off, the king ten off, the ace nine of diamonds, uh, king jack, like queen jack. These hands, they feel a bit more intuitive because it doesn't really feel like they're accomplishing that much, you know, and it's, yeah, I feel like people have a tendency to just play pure check with these instead. But poker is, of course, not that simple and... Even if these hands don't accomplish much right now um, on this street, they do have some benefits down the line, like board coverage on fu future streets and so on. For what it's worth, like a lot of these medium looking type hands, which feels a bit awkward to lead in case we get jammed on, simply en ends up calling off at that point due to the amazing price we're getting. Hands like, uh, like the jack five off, queen five off, king five off, ace nine suited with backdoor flush draw and stuff. Like, these hands feel really awkward to jam, uh, to lead, because what happens if we get jammed on? But they actually just have enough equity. So if you lead them, you just press call. Uh, we can go into this and show it real quick. So, like, some of these hands. And, and we are actually getting jammed on quite a bit here. Like, 18.5% uh, of the time, he's going to be jamming, like, a bunch of uh, top pairs, and then, like, a bunch of draws himself. But, yeah. Of course, we're getting an amazing price. So we can see like Jack-5 off, just pure call. Uh, Queen-5 off, pure call. Ace-9 diamond, Ace-9 clubs, yeah, call. 10-8 off, call. So a lot of these hands, they feel really weird to to lead. Like this one as well, 6 is suited. Okay, so this one we just call when we are back to the flush on. Anyways, it, it, it's pretty difficult to play this strategy because you have to make a lot of like marginal calls like this, but I think it's worth it. Like, I often hear players argue that they don't want to incorporate leading strategies because it complicates things for not that much EV gain. But we can have a look at this statement as well and see if it holds true. Like, first of all, let's have a look at how much EV we're actually losing by not doing it. So let's have a look at this six, uh, seven, six, uh, four rainbow flop and check with the node lock function how much EV we're actually losing. Uh, so if we go back here and we node lock, we can see 
Okay, so I'm going to force it to play 100% check instead of this GTO strategy. Yes, lock all and continue. And what we can do from here is that we can go into the compare nodes function right here. Uh, we click that. So on the right is the GTO strategy and on the left is range check. Uh, if we press this one right here, we go over to the EV tab and we're losing. So GTO is 2.95 EV and range check is 2.84. So 0 0.11 big blinds or 11 big blinds per 100, if you will. Yeah, which is something, you know. I don't think it's uh, so small that we should just ignore it. The other argument for checking pure instead of incorporating leads is that leading complicates our strategy. To this, I, I would say, yes, it does. But on the flip side, it also complicates life for our opponent, you know, which is probably more used to playing against check than against lead. And as such, he's probably has not studied uh, how to play against the lead as much. If you spend some time actually learning these strategies, I think overall it's going to be a more complicated time for your opponent than for you, which, yeah, I think is worth it. All right, so let's move on to 30 big blinds. First, we can have a quick look at the ranges again to see how they look. This is his button range, which is quite a lot wider now than than the one we saw before, which makes a lot of sense. He's gonna get re-jammed on less often and his positional advantage is gonna be more important the deeper we get, right? So it makes sense that he gets to expand his range a bit at this stack depth. Also no jams now. So effectively he's putting, he's opening wider, but he's putting like uh, less money in due to not having jams in a sense, right? So yeah, anyways, he opens, and the big blind is calling a range that looks like this. So very similar to the previous calling range. Very, very similar. Uh, we're jamming a bit less of the ASX hands now. And yeah, a bit less of these like um, suited connectors here. But in general, we're defending very wide and we have a lot of both strong hands and board coverage everywhere in the defending range. So yeah, cool. Okay, so let's do the same thing as we did for 20 bigs. Let's begin with scrolling through this reports sorting tab. Okay, so first of all, we can see that six high boards are still amazing for us. Seven high boards as well, a bit less so now, but still six and seven high boards are the best for us. No big surprise there. Yeah, rainbow, flush rock and a close, very similar again. Uh, pair is actually slightly better now, but this is very specific for some paired boards again, as I said. Connected is going to be better for us again. So yeah, very similar, I would say, to Twin Bigs. Okay, so instead of having a look at another typical prime lead candidate board, like uh, the 654 here, let's rather have a quick look at what kind of paired boards are good, because uh, as we saw in this one, we saw that paired boards are actually preferred now over non-paired, but it's very specific um, boards for that one. So let's have a quick look at one of those. If you see on the left end here, like you, you can you can spot a few ones if you like uh, keep going here. Uh, let's see, or we can actually just go over here. We can press paired, uh, and we won't have to look for them. So we can see the most lead is like 655, uh, 755. These are like the most intuitive ones, right? But when you do move down the rankings here, you'll find that we also do incorporate leads on some of the more unintuitive ones like this, Jack 55, Queen 55, uh, King 55, Queen 66, a lot of these ones. And I thought it would be cool to do a bit of digging on one of these. So let's sort it by King, Queen, Jack high boards, and have a look. Uh, so we can see now that the main leading board for these are going to be the Jack Jack five five flush draw. So let's have a quick look at that one. Okay, so we can see that uh, this is now just solved uh, from the aggregate report. 
So as usual, I think it's a good idea to start by AI solving it to find our actually uh, our actual preferred sizing. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to load my own tree. Uh, I'm going to use the standard one for this and go. Okay, so you can see that two thirds is our preferred sizing here. We're not leading that much. It's only 14%. But if you look into the ranges here, we can see, <laughs> like I, I was actually quite surprised here. You know, like we're leading 14% of our range for B66 and we're at a 43% equity disadvantage like look at this how crazy is that he has 57 percent equity which is heaps and we still incorporate a reasonable leading strategy for um quite a big size as well i would say so <clears throat> i spent a good hour investigating this one plus chatting back and forth with um, theory god tom boss 21 from gta wizard team and my first idea was that we do have a decent nut advantage. Like if we look at this, we have 10.3% equity versus 5.1 in the top equity bracket here, um, which is decent. Like if we look at the hands here as well, you we can see that we're flopping trips 9.5% of the time. He only flops trips 4.1% of the time. So yeah, okay, decent nut advantage, but I was still surprised that this was enough to develop a decent leading range here at such a big equity disadvantage. Tombos had a pretty cool idea though, which was that it's not just about the nut advantage here, but also about how polarized the big blind range is. Big blind simply doesn't have that many medium showdown type hands, right? Like the under pairs, uh, like the ace highs, etc. Uh, as most of these will shove pre, right? Like, okay, we have some of these offsuit ASX hands, but we have zero of the pairs. Uh, and like a lot of these ace high hands are just mixing as well. So we don't have many medium showdown hands. And as such, the button has less incentive to bet himself, right? And if the button has less incentive to bet because we are so polar in the big blind, then we have to in start uh, incorporating some leads to start building the pot, right? So. What type of hands are we leading here? Um, we can go back into the strategy tab and have a quick look. I think a cool function to dig a bit deeper here is using this filters tab. Like here, for example, you can filter for, let's say, uh, trips. So we can filter for trips and see if we can find any heuristics for the 5x portion of the range, for example. So. If you go here and we filter for having a heart, for example, like it's two hearts on board. So if we filter for having a trips plus a heart, we can see that our leading goes down like quite a lot. We're only leading like 10% of the time if we have a heart kicker uh, versus 35% of the time if we don't have a heart kicker, right? So this is just uh, mainly due to the fact that when we are betting a five, we want to get called, right? We have trips. So if we're holding a heart with our five, the chances of getting called are gonna be lower as the villain will continue more if he has a backdoor flush draw or a flush draw, right? So as we need some five X in both the betting range and the checking range, just for balancing reasons, we prefer to include the five X with a heart in our checking range as they are more li likely to produce folds from villain when we are betting, right? We could also have a quick look at Top pair, for example, we can see that top pair is playing very passively, just betting 10% of the time. Most of our bets is going to come from King Jack with the opposite suits, like the King Jack that doesn't have diamonds, for example, in the suited portion. And in the offsuit portion, we want to be betting, yeah, again, just for the most part, opposite suits. Less when we have the King of Hearts, because we do want him to float with uh, backdoor flush draws, flush draws, whatever. Um, yeah, so same thing as we saw with the trips, basically. What about bluffs? Where do we draw the bluffs from? I think here, um, a good place to start is to tick the boxes to only select uh, ace high, king high, or no made hand, for example. If we tick these three boxes here, now we can see everything that is worse than one pair. From here, we can see that we're betting only 12% of the time, which is quite low, but from there, we can do some other stuff to figure out where do we draw the bluffs from exactly. 
We can do stuff like exclude the offsuit hands without clubs or spades, for example. Like over here, you can do include or exclude. So if we exclude spades or clubs, which effectively selecting only the hands that has perfect suits matching the boards, uh, the board for us, right? We can see that we're betting a lot more all of a sudden, 36% versus 12% overall, right? So even though the betting frequency on this board is low, we can see that some of these bluffs are bet at a very high frequency, right? Like if you look at like king four off here with perfect suits, heart, diamond, we're just pure betting pretty much. Um, king three off the same, queen four off, very high frequency, ace three off, very high frequency, plus a bunch of these like connected hands that has perfect suits plus uh, backdoor straight equity, right? Like four three, six fours, like they love it. We can also see that hands that unblock more of villain's folding range is betting more. So for example, these two hands like 4-3 off, 6-4 uh, off, they're betting more than for example, these hands like 10-7 off, 10-6 off, 9-6 off. Even though they have very similar equity, like if we sort here by uh, strategy plus equity, we can see that uh, these hands have like 21-22% equity, which is very similar to these hands but still they're betting way more than these hands, just because these hands are gonna be blocking more of villain's folding range, right? When we're betting as a bluff, you wanna unblock villain's folding range. And we can see like, if we just, we can easily illustrate this if we just press the bet to see how uh, our opponent is going to react. Uh, I'm just gonna clear the filters here. We can see that a lot of his folding range is coming from this middling part of the range, right? A lot of 8x, a lot of 9x, a lot of 10x. Um, so not too much stuff down here, right? Because it's not opening that. So that's what's going on there. We can also do the opposite here. If you go back to the filters, like we can, we can exclude like, um, yeah, okay, so let's, um, let's do this first, select for these again. If we exclude like the hands, with perfect suits, like if we don't have one diamond or one heart, we don't have any of them, we can see that we're just pure checking. Like none of these like no equity hands that doesn't have any potential are betting here, which makes a lot of sense, right? Like these hands can be included in betting ranges if we have like a big equity advantage and we can push that for example, but here we're at a big equity disadvantage, right? So we have to be kind of selective about what bluffs we're drawing from. We can also include, or we can repeat this experiment for the suited portion of the grid as well. Let's exclude a spade club diamond first. So spade club diamond um, to see how we play with flush draws. We're betting 18% of the time here using pretty scattered selection of hands. No immediate pattern here stand out to me at least. We can also have a look at the backdoor flush draws, if we do like this. So we can see that we're actually betting more with the backdoor flush draws here at 23%. Here, it's a bit easier to spot a pattern, I think, uh, since these hands need more equity to put money into the pot than the flush draws do. Uh, we do prefer the hands that have some backdoor straight draw opportunities. We see like a lot of these hands are like uh, surrounding the board in some way, right? We want to have some of that uh, backdoor straight potential as well, not only the backdoor flush potential, just because we need more equity, right? I think that's it. I think we can move on to 40 big blinds. Okay, same procedure as we did for 20 and 30. Let's have a look at the ranges real quick first. Um, we can see that we're opening even wider now, which again, makes sense. We are deeper, we're gonna get shoved on less and we're in position, which makes us wanna play more deep stacked. So 51% opening range here, every ace x, king six off plus. Yeah, most of this suited, uh, pretty standard. I don't have to go too much in detail of that. People know how to play a button opening range. Big blind range here is now gonna be shoving way less. We're only reshoving 5.6%, uh, attributing non all in 12% and calling 60%. So now we're a bit more protected on the ace high boards than we were on the previous ones. And yeah, outside of that, it looks pretty similar. We have like the full suited grid pretty much, uh, except for the top part. And yeah, let's go into the aggregate report again. 
we can see that now we're leading even less, only 2% leads overall, which is pretty low. But if we look here, we can see it's kind of the same thing going on. A lot of six high, a lot of seven high. But let's click through here real quick. Yeah, six high, seven high, five high, eight high, okay. Um, for suits, rainbow and flush draw, still no leading on monotone. Paired, we still prefer over non-paired. Um, it's going to be the same thing, like very specific paired boards. And still a heavy preference for the connected boards. If we scroll down the list of leading here, we can see that it's pretty much the same story, right? A lot of the same ones, and we still find leads on uh, some like of these king 6-6, six, six, queen 6-6. Six, six. Yeah, same story. Uh, let's do a bit of digging into the top board, which is 654 Rainbow. All right, so again, I'm going to rerun it to find our optimal sizing here. let use my own sizings and go. Okay, so you can see that B40 is going to be our preferred sizing here. Uh, if we're sizing, if we're solving for a one size solution, uh, I'm sure if you add multiple sizings that that might split into multiple sizings, but I don't really like to do that. So we're going to go with one and that's going to be B40. If we look at the ranges, we have a slight equity advantage at 51%. And we have a bit less EV. We're going to realize our equity a bit worse than the in-position player here. So if we look at the hands, we have more straights, we have more two pairs. He has a bit more sets than us. He's the only guy with sets. Um, we can look at this one, for example, we can see that like in the 80 to 100% equity distribution, uh, we have quite a big advantage. We have like twice as many hands as him in both of these categories, uh, which is where we draw uh, the leading range from. If we sort like this, we can see as well, we have more good hands, we have more best hands than him. So let's look at the hands that we're betting here. And we can see that we're basically mixing hands from the entire grid. There's like a few combos here and there that prefer just pure checking, like these ones. You have a few scattered in here, like a few uh, few of the worst pairs here. And yeah, since we're deep enough now to uh, play some bet 3 bet, I think it's cool to look at how that plays out. So let's have a look. Uh, if we're betting B40 here and we get raised, which you get raised a reasonable clip here. He's raising quite big sizing as well, like R70, so a bit more than 4x R size. And he's doing that 16% of the time. So yeah, quite often. Um, for his raising range, there's not that many surprises, I think. For, uh, for me, there are a few hands that stand out here, which I wouldn't have found myself, and that I doubt population really finds, like, uh, the the ace dues off here seems a bit iffy to me, but it's like pretty much pure. Uh, the low frequency ace jack and ace ten uh, with the matching suits. These ones seem a bit. Um, yeah, I don't think population necessarily will find these ones. I think also maybe looking at his calling range, I think that's also a bit wider than I would expect population to play. Maybe like his floating hands, like king jack off. King nine off, especially this one seems a bit weird to me, you know, like ace nine up to ace queen. I, I, I feel like it's unlikely that this is going to happen in game, that villain is going to find all of these floats. Like we're betting B40 here, it's not like B25 or anything. So yeah, a bit, a bit surprised by that. Let's have a look at how we respond versus the race. Okay, so we're basically playing more jams than calls here versus his race. Basically every pair with additional equity, so like a straight draw, um, like 8-6 for example, or with backdoor flush draw, like a bunch of these hands, uh, we're just happy to wager all of it. Same goes for a bunch of the open-enders, like all of these ones, right? Like the King-7, seven, Queen-7, seven, Jack-7, seven, 10 seven. Yeah, especially these open-enders that has backdoor flush draws, Queen-3 diamonds, Queen-3 clubs. For slow plays, let's have a look at what we're doing there. We are, let's see. Okay, so 6-4 is a good example, I guess. 
six four of diamonds. So where we have the backdoor flush draw here. So if you look at six four, okay, yes, we're splitting six four into two. Like if you have spades, we just jam. But if you have diamonds, we're calling. This is pretty typical, right? That you slow play the one that is like too nutted to jam, basically. <laughs> it's a very theoretical way to explain that. Same with this one, 5-4 of spades, we're just jamming, while 5-4 of hearts, uh, we're calling. We can see that hearts is um, connecting to the 6 here, right? Yep, same with 8-7. If you have a straight uh, with 8-7, 8-7 uh, of spades, we're just jamming. With the suited ones, we are pure calling. Cool. I think that's enough of this sim. Uh, let's move on to the 50 big blind sim. And then I think we'll go quickly through that and then wrap it up with a quick summary. All right, so this is the 50 big blind sim opening even wider. I guess I don't have to explain and keep explaining why that's happening. He's opening it wider and now we almost don't play any jams at all. We jam a little bit of this, or mostly jamming with these two uh, pairs here, sevens and eights. Ace queen off is pretty high frequency. Ace deuce off as well, uh, and then trees and deuces a little bit. Yeah, we're finding a bit more bluffs in the suited portion of the range now, uh, of the grid, since we are getting deeper. Uh, like 40 and sub 40, we're tributing as bluffs mostly from this part of the grid, the offsuit ones. But once you get deeper, you have to start incorporating some more suited stuff since the more, uh, the higher the SPR is going to be on the flop, the more important it is to have hands that can make actual good hands, you know. Go to the aggregation report again. So you can see that it's pretty much the same pattern again, like slightly less leads again. It was 2% before, now it's 1.7%. Hand selection looks to be pretty much exactly the same as before. Um, yeah, like your typical suspects, you know, like 5-4-3, whatever, 6-5-3, uh, king 6-6, six, six, queen 6-6. Six, six. I don't think there is much more to look at here. We can sort through here again, but it's going to be exactly the same thing. 6-5 are good, 5-5 are good. 7-5 a bit worse now, actually. Uh, I guess that's because the villain is opening a bit wider. So maybe he's opening a bit more 7x now than he was before. Uh, we can actually have a quick look at that one to see. So you can see, like here, uh, the reason we're leading less on the 7x board now is that our uh, our advantage in having 7x is just not as big as before. We have queen 7 off, uh, we have 9 7 off, we have 10 7 off, uh, 7 4 suited. I'm going to guess that if we go down to 40 bigs again, some of these hands are going to disappear. So we can uh, have a quick look at that to confirm. Yeah. So we can see this one disappears, this one disappears. We're mixing with queen seven and seven four suited disappears. So this is why we lead less on the seven X now, just because our advantage in uh, flopping top pairs is gonna be slightly lower. That makes a lot of sense. For suits, uh, still no leading on monotone, no big surprise. Uh, paired, yeah, this is, as we spoke about, just like very specific paired boards. Yeah, connected, still much better. So I think that's enough. I don't think there's much point in going into another example here. This video is getting long enough, so I think we're gonna hop straight into a summary instead. All right, so here we are at the summary part of the video. First of all, we lead more versus shallow stack depths. This makes a lot of sense intuitively and is very common heuristic for a lot of spots in poker. When you are out of position, you tend to be more careful about building pots at higher stack to pot ratios. The higher the SPR, the more to your disadvantage your position is going to be, right, when you're calling from the big blind. We also tend to lead more versus later position opens. This also makes a lot of intuitive sense. Later position opens are gonna, gonna have wider ranges and we are overall gonna have more equity versus a button open range than versus an under the gun eight open range. We're mostly gonna lead on low and connected boards as this is where we will have mostly have the nut advantage. 
Uh, we're going to be flopping more straights, more two pairs, more play pair plus draw, more combo draws, etc. Like thinking back to his opening grid, he's just going to be lacking so much of the stuff that's going on down there, especially in the offsuit part of the grid, right? Outside of this, um, these like low connected boards, we will mostly be leading when there's a pair on board and the difference in trips is going to be significant. Remember like the king 6-6, six, six, uh, jack 5-5, five, five, etc. So even at the big equity disadvantage for these boards, we will develop leading ranges if the nut advantage is big enough. Okay, that's gonna be it. Thank you for watching and see you for the next video. Next video is gonna be a similar concept, but we're gonna be looking at small blind versus button. So yeah, thank you for watching and see you for the next one.